Spalding Gray has been recounting his observations about life to audiences for nearly two decades. His most recent project, It's a Slippery Slope. In the monologue, Gray tells audiences about some of the changes that he has encountered in midlife, from fatherhood to divorce and learning how to ski. Here is an excerpt. Now we're skiing together down Ruthie's Run, a vertical that I would have tumbled down before, but now I'm catching myself and I understand that you have to be out of control to be in control. And you come around and you turn right and you're out of control and you're in control. In Leap of Faith I'm around and I doubted everything until this moment. And now if I doubt that I can turn, I crash, but I don't doubt in Leap of Faith and I'm around and I catch myself in Leap of Faith I'm around. In Leap of Faith I'm around and Maggie shoots behind me with these stereo earphones on saying, think of it as a white wall of death and I'm going oh I know where she gets her kicks she wants me to do a monologue about this and she wants to be in it and I'm staying up and it's fantastic all my life I've been anxious now I have something that I actually fear it's real fear the object the mountain no oh, leap of faith I'm around and it's a wonderful afternoon <laughs> the monologue is now a book joining me for a guided tour of the slippery slopes Spalding Gray welcome back thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, why this, I should guess, I should ask you at the beginning. I mean, I always wanted to know what it is you're going to talk about. Is right. it going to be about building a house? Is yeah. it going to be... And I don't know until the thing takes me, and I'm in it. And, and then I, I start talking about it to try to understand it in, in publicly. I'm mean, using my, my public as a way to process it. And also, I have this sense that I'm, I'm only living once. It's, I'm pretty clear about that. And it's a way of living twice. It's the best I can do of reincarnating myself is, is, is memory. And to tell a memory, I've often said, is, is more fun than living it. I mean, I, I have to live a life to, to, to tell a life. But I, I really was this any harder than the others? This was harder. This is a more difficult monologue because I, I admit and show my shadow. I think it's a watershed monologue. I think the other monologues were always about me being the victim and having the audience be the mother and me crying out, look, yeah, look, right. I'm drowning. And also in my relationship with Renee Shafransky, uh, which was similar to with the audience of, of always being in need of being nurtured and mothered. And in this uh, monologue, I, I, I say, hey, I did this. And the, I, I take more responsibility. And there were a lot of horror. I, I, my shadow showing in this. I mean, I'm not a good guy. I, I mean, Terry Gross interviewed me and said, my goodness, Spalding, this, this, yeah. the, the, on Fresh Air, you appear to be a bad guy in this. I said, I am. And I'm also good. You know, I contradict myself. Now, was that difficult for you? Um, it, it, was, it was difficult for me to do only because oh, yeah. I expected people to throw uh, fruit at me, rotten fruit and tomatoes. And I was only hissed once by women in Chicago. They hissed what, me what twice did they hiss at? They hissed at when I talk about saying when I first saw my son. I didn't see my son until he was eight months. And I, I realized that this was it because there was, I said there was often and always another woman over that shoulder, over that shoulder, over that shoulder. But there was never just another son. You didn't say, hey, look at that son. It was a unique creation. And that was the hiss came because no one wants to be just another woman over her shoulder. Although yeah. I don't mind being called just another man as long as I'm you know, noticed. <laughs> when you when you do this, well, I mean, how do how do you get from not knowing what the hell you're going to do? Yeah, that's a good, you know, to to hear. I'm a collage artist, and 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 I sit down, and in fact, I'm starting to do it now with new material. The new material being the life I've lived since this one, which has been three years and a lot of stuff. And I have these notebooks, you know, the, the, these little marble seventh grade uh, composition notebooks, school notebooks, and in that I have kept rough diaries, I mean, very sketchy uh, of things Forrest has said or thought, thoughts, lots of that. And I start to look through those, and I'm reviewing that past three years of my life. And I begin to see what that structure is, what it presents to me, and how could I tie it together? How could I make the collage? I'm really cutting up the pieces of my life, cutting and pasting, juxtaposing. And I start with a pencil outline. In, in, in a spiral notebook. And then I will make a deadline when I'm going to perform that. That's what the deadline is. I'll say at Vineyard Haven Playhouse, where I did a slippery slope for, for 90 people coming this August. I will make a date to do that. And as I get closer to that, the more my mind begins to formulate how that outline should go. Then I sit down with the outline and I speak it for the first time publicly. I have never done one alone. I've never pre written it. Uh, Grey's Anatomy was going to be a cover story for the New York Times. I said it's not ready. My, my agent said, it's for the New York Times, it's a cover story. I said, it doesn't exist yet. She said, well, make it exist. Make it exist. I said, I don't have a performance until March. She said, that's too late. Make right. it. So I hired an editor, John Howell, a friend of mine. He sat across from me, yeah. and I told him the story. He was my first audience, just yeah. like you. It was one-on-one, -on -one, but I was telling the story from an outline.
It's oral composition. What's the hardest part for you? The hardest part of the process, I suppose, is the void part that ex where you think there's, no, there's, there's, there's nothing there that's going to be of interest, that you finally, your life is private, boring, um, yeah. Yeah, common. Exactly. Exactly. I'll give you an example. Um, I moved out to Sag Harbor, Long Island, a year right. ago. And, um, and, and I'm in a community there, and things are pretty slow. And uh, I have to do um, a, a radio interview for, for Slippery Slope, which has a lot of angst in it. Right. And it's going to be a live hookup with Norwalk, with, yeah. with, with, with Connecticut, right? And, and I'm at, a, at my son's uh, uh, picnic, and his friend's father says, Why don't we go sailing? I have a 38 foot boat. It's May. It's love. Happened to be my birthday. It was June 5th. And I said, gee, it's my birthday. That would be a nice Great treat. Idea. And he goes out and gets a bottle of Rifki Co. And I uh, remembered I had an interview. And he said, do it on the boat. Just have the station call the boat. So we're out on the boat. At 12 20, uh, 2 27, he opens the champagne and we pour it out. And I'm supposed to be on the phone talking about anxious Spalding Greg, Ebb of the Grave of God, he's in the bullpen again, and aren't we lucky we're not him, and he's so neurotic, and I have nothing to complain about except it's not windy. We're almost <laughs> becalmed. That's the extent of it, you know, when you go, oh, the audience is going to go, I'm just, my fear is the audience is going to go, oh, hum. Yeah. And in other words, happiness uh, or contentment, which I welcome and which I am getting good doses of now, yeah. may not be uh, edgy enough. You know, I feel like a suddenly a you, Californian. <laughs> well, oh wait, but you think there may be some danger in being too too uh, content? The, if you don't scare, if you're not scared, if there's no edge, if you're not worried, if you're not feeling it, like it, the I'm, cartoon I'm, I'm, of I'm Spalding, about to be embarrassed. Yeah, the cartoon of the anxious Spalding Gray that people long for. I mean, yeah. most George Carlin. You see a picture of George Carlin, you yeah. know, it's always the same. The shoulders are raised. He's always in the same anxious state. That's the product that he sells. I think that my persona, and I'm probably not answering your question, because probably what would be yeah. the most difficult thing or fearful thing? Yeah. My children invading their privacy, using them as a material, and therefore turning But you do more of that here than anything you've ever done. Yeah. I do, but it's because he was brand new there. So yeah. think of what's to come. I have another one. Skiing. I mean, that's dangerous. Now that's probably the one. <laughs> I probably have an, I, I don't. Why uh, did you decide at your age to take up skiing? Uh, however old you are. You know what? I had always felt I wanted to ride an element. Everyone was riding the elements now. I think all of this riding the elements is a reaction to virtual reality. And people, people when I was a kid went jumping out of airplanes and bungee jumping and, and, and that's, and I thought, well, what element, you know, I, I'm, Midlife crisis, the missile, it's midlife is a min, misnomer, certainly midlife is 34. We go into a crisis because we know at 52 it's not midlife. Yeah. And at 52 I said, I want to, I want to, what's it going to be? It's not going to be hang gliding. Right. What was it that I always wanted to do that I denied myself? Skiing, free lessons in Maine, 1956. Yeah. Didn't do it, was always lingering. So I'm going to take a lesson. It was in Flagstaff, Arizona, and so it was a was beautiful day. What? Well, the year that I took it, yeah. I would have been 52, so that I'd yeah. be, I, 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 it was, uh, yeah. I'm 56 right. now. So I'm not, I fail seventh grade math. I can't do quick figures. Yeah, okay. So it's 25 years. Yeah. 25 was, years. Yeah. yeah. Was waiting to be done. I mean, but how could you avoid doing it? I was very interior. I was not real physical. I was in the city. Uh, I couldn't afford it. I, I wasn't offered it. It wasn't, it, it didn't present itself, and it's icy here. It wasn't until I started getting out into the West and touring a lot in the West and realizing there were things to do out there in the winter that were fabulous, uh, skiing. Yeah, if I had started, if I had taken that free ski lesson in Freiburg, Maine in 1956 and hit that ice in 30 degree below weather, yeah. I would have gone back to my room and continued reading Satra. Yeah. That's what, that was what I was yeah. doing at the time. Do you think, do you think that, that you, I mean, this, what you do is unique. No one does what you do as far as I can, do you know anybody? who's made a career out of the kind of monologue The ongoing uh, soap opera. No, right, they exactly. haven't at that. There are people starting, starting to do to it. To do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but, copy, no. but copying you. Yeah, I, I think that I am the you, main force influence in that. Yeah, yeah. Because well, what certain, is it you think, what is it that makes it attractive? What is it you bring you know, to that monologue? A, 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 a relatively honest voice, which we don't mm. hear a lot of. I mean, Princess Di was some 
famous for that. I mean, that's what people loved about her. You think that was it? That, that, that was one of the big ones. It was a relatively honest voice. There was a frankness yeah. there. And, and, and in a man, in a man, it, it, who, who else are we hearing? Everyone has an agenda. They are selling, they're a politician or they're selling a product or a religion. Mm -hmm. And I, yes, I'm selling myself, but I'm also, I'm also in a, a state of questioning and doubt. And, and I, I think it's a, it's a contemporary voice. I think it's that also, but I just think when you have, and I don't know what it is, because I mean, I've never seen, an, I've seen, I think, everything you've ever done. Uh huh. Well, and it, all wonderful. of it, well, I, mean, I think it is somehow. I mean, I just think, I think this is a rare talent. It is the ability to make what other people could do, and it wouldn't be nearly as interesting. Somehow, you mm -hmm. somewhere picked up this capacity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to tell an, a story right. and to make it compelling. Mm -hmm. I did, do, I, and it's from doing it. It's from doing it. I do workshops occasionally in, in this, yeah. in, at Esalen Institute, and, and it, it really, what I'm only saying to the people there is that if you keep, if you get in a place where you can do it and workshop it and do it and retell it, 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 it really, you begin to learn how to do it. So I've done it through time. And also, I'm in a very privileged place. I, I, I don't have to pay any, I don't have to pay attention to anything I don't want to, I'm free to pay attention to things. It's a very, it's a very meditative state. The audience, if I come back with a good story, is supporting me to pay attention to life. Not just my life, but life. And that's a beautiful, that's a, that's a poetic space. Do you feel vulnerable at all? Or is it now, at some point, you've reached the page where... I, yeah. Where I, well, I, do, I certainly do feel vulnerable in the sense you that You still I, do. Well, I'm very aware that I could die at any moment, and that's a great sense well, of vulnerability. Well, I don't mean that, but I mean, you, do, you, do you feel so sense that, that, that somehow, by this exposure and the way I tell these stories, that I am somehow opening myself up to my story? I, I don't feel vulnerable that at way all. anymore, no. Did I, you I, once? Uh, going through, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. When I went out on stage in, uh, in, in, in New York City, and, and I was very nervous about. Uh, I was very nervous about what the press would do to me. I, 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 I was already calling myself the avant garde Jimmy Swaggart. You know, <laughs> so to beat the press in doing it, I was trying to think that that's what they were going to say. And my younger brother, who uh, Channing Gray, who's a he's, a he's a music critic for the Providence Journal, he said, "Don't worry, you're the Teflon of performance artists." <laughs> <laughs> That's what was coming. I said, you'll get through. Uh, and um, so I felt vulnerable to the press. I thought that, that they, they are going to say this is exploitative and, 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 and it's pop psychology. And, 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 and the New York Times wrote a very good review. And I was very pleased with it. I, I was, I guess, more afraid of, of, of the You were fearful press. that they would say what? It's, it's just, this is, this is not substantive and this is not serious. And, and, and yes, the, your, experience, uh, your experience at, as a skier is fine and interesting. That's very nice. But... But um, he's you know, uh, uh, he's uh, had to put this horrible pop psychology piece about exactly. the breakup with his girlfriend yeah, in exactly. the middle of it all. Right, exactly. Whereas they said it balanced it, which is absolutely true. This piece is like a triptych, a slippery slope. It really is like a, a three-part thing of learning to ski, then the breakup, and right. then the, and the new configuration of the family and returning to New England. And it reminds me of like a concerto. We're, we're going to actually do a CD of it. and. Um, Mercury Records is going to do it, and James Taylor is going to produce it. And James Jan Taylor. James Taylor produce? is the producer. We're going to do it on Martha's Vineyard, and we're going to we're, we're going to tape it there home. with sound effects. Yeah, we're, I'm going to try to make it like an old radio. Well, I grew up with radio, like an old radio uh, uh, piece. What don't you put in here that you thought about? Oh, I mean, whew. where do you draw the wow. line? You know, in therapy, actually, I didn't think I could do another monologue. I pretty much. Uh, almost cracked up uh, just before this monologue was. Are you serious? Yeah, Come on. Yeah, w was was told that I was manic depressive. Was on uh, clonopin and lithium and seeing a top psychopharmacologist Are here in New York City. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know if that monologue gives a flavor of the uh, of, of the of of the crack up. Uh, and I uh, um, skiing really gave me a sense of balance in the middle of that crack crack up. But um, what was the question? <laughs> well, what, what didn't you tell us that we might? Oh, know? oh my in God! Other words, that was in the therapist lab. That's what helped me through. Uh, I, I had a very good uh, yeah. uh, woman therapist that uh, that uh, I laid out this stuff. I laid out my shadow in her yeah. her lap, as it were, and we we began to figure out what was public and what was private. And how so did you? And, and, and okay, I mean, I'm trying to. I can't tell the private stuff. I well, actually no, have the private stuff. To do. But I mean, yeah. at least tell me how you decide what's. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I worked with a dramaturg on this, Paul Spencer, who helped after I developed it. You know, I said, look, you know, you, no, 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 you, no, no you, be, you be a witness to this. You know, yeah. be a witness. What do you think should stay in and what should go? Yeah. And, and that all has to do with art, art you know, creation of. Oh, does this have a good resonance? You know, is, is it repeated somewhere else? Okay, here, so the, the test was not whether it was embarrassing and no, it might hurt somebody. Structure. The test structure. was, does right. it play? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was strictly a career yeah, it was, decision. It was, not, it was not all is fair in love and war and art. So you let it all hang out as long as the oh, dramatist what? says, this advances our case. This advances our Oh, no, our, no, I didn't let it all hang out because it, it hung out in the therapist's office before that. You know, people say, how can you put your life on, all your life yeah, on stage? Yeah, I'm, I'm 56 years old. I know. The uh, monologue is an hour and a half. Think of what <laughs> is left out. Think of the enormity of that. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah, but see, a lot there's something about you that makes you reveal more than most. For sure. And true. you somehow picked up true. on the idea that you could true. make that revelation attractive. The audience taught me that. I mean, they were my first teachers. They were my first editors. They sat and listened, and they responded, and they enjoyed, and they told me. You know, when I was first working with the Worcester Group, I was in, in, in a collective for a long time, yeah. and I knew I wanted to go solo. And I had an image that what I was going to do was run down 42nd Street in a red jock strap. And I knew that I wasn't going to do that as an art piece, but I knew that it had to do with exposure. And the point is that I, I wanted to expose more than just my... Uh, just my uh, body. It was uh, psyche and heart and the whole, the whole, the whole uh, salad. Is it a freeing experience to be able to, to talk about all this? To an extent, yeah, 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 to, to an extent, because it certainly, don't you feel that, I mean, yeah. in yourself? I mean, yeah. when you do it, I mean, when you do it with... But I don't do it like you do. I mean, but I don't no, know, where do you do it, though? With, with conversations with your, yeah, and yeah. dialogue. Yeah, it's always... But it's that. private, I'm not on, I don't sit here in front of a camera. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I, yeah. my purpose is to get other people to do it, that's... But it is selective, and it really. But you is. do. You give a little bit. In other, you know. In other words, you, know, you can't do what I do every night without having something. I'm. I live in Saigon, Long Island now. I don't know if I can do another monologue. You know about living there. I mean, you know, w w w w w w you know, it's really like I have to run into everyone on the street every day. The Bay Street Theater wants me to test it out there. It's like hanging your dirty underwear up or all is your it, underwear. Is it in the end the way? Do you tweak this? Do you? Yeah, do you, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I call it uh, hyperbole, which means in hyperbole Greek, is a better word. to throw beyond. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a, a dramatist in the sense of the way that I perceive and report reality. And my stepdaughter, Marissa, is always informing me that I am that, and I'm always exaggerating. Yeah. And and how do you, in the end, feel about skiing? I am so involved with it still, and this is a treat because I thought that once I talked it out. Yeah. That it would just be material, and I'd go on to the next right. thing, and I'm I'm going out again this year, and I, I am I look forward to winters now. It is my real um, escape, my real healthy escape, and I'm able to be alone with it. I, I'm going to be skiing probably uh, uh, sixty days. Um, this sixty year. days this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, sex and death to the age fourteen. Swim into Cambodia, which I remember, in search of the monkey girl orchards, monster in a box, impossible vacation, Gary's, Raven uh, and just think of those, all those publications, yeah. all yeah. those monologues, all those stories. Are yeah. you doing any acting? I wish I, I was. Something happened. I haven't done a, a, a film. Actually, though, I am playing Fran Drescher's. Um, I'm playing the nanny's therapist. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, Fran Drescher saw me do a slippery slope in L.A. and called me uh, directly, called our babysitter, the nanny yeah. calling the nanny, and said, would you play my, my therapist? I said, I don't have a TV. I haven't seen the show. I don't know. So they sent me 12 tapes of the nanny. <laughs> and it turned out to be a good combo, Fran right. Drescher and I. So I'm doing that. All no right. feature films, and I don't know why. To my family, this is dedicated. Forrest, Marissa, Kathy, and Theo. Uh, it's a slippery slope. Uh, another monologue by Spalding Gray and Gray's Anatomy, with a directed by Stephen uh, Soderbergh. Right. There you go. Yeah. Same. Stephen Soderbergh did uh, King of the Hill, which I was in. Yeah, yeah, and Sex Lies and Videotapes, which is what I first remember. Right. Right. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow night.